Hey, welcome to the Hold the Line podcast. Man, I'm so, so excited today. So pumped to have a great friend and an amazing senator, Josh Hawley, on here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thank you for having me. Yeah, you were, uh, just to give people a little context, uh, Josh was actually my very first guest with my podcast. Number this one. was back. I was number yeah. one. Was <laughs> you were number one. This was like back in. Voice, like. <laughs> This was back in, I think, 2020, I believe, right? It was 2020, yeah, 2020, in, 2020. in my my barn there in Reading, and yeah, it was just so cool. So you you kicked this whole thing off, and man, it, God's done some cool stuff. But I I'm really really excited, and first of all, just want to say on behalf of my family in America and so many people, Josh, we're we're so grateful for you, and you know your your courage, your boldness, your tenacity, and your faithfulness, and there's so many folks out there watching this and, 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 and listening that are praying for you and praying for your family. So, oh, thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. We're super grateful. And um, I was just in Jefferson, in Jefferson City. Uh, thousands of people showed up for the King of the Capital Tour in your state. It, it blew my mind. I was actually laughing hysterically because when I walked out of the bus, you know, I didn't think it's Jefferson, it's a small city. There was five, six thousand people there. Wow, wow. that's awesome. You that's know? awesome. That and, tour is so uh, powerful, though. I mean, it's just, I think it speaks to the power of what you're doing. People want to come be part of it. Yeah, I mean, in, 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 in your state, especially, there's just such incredible people, you know, that just, they love America, they love God, they, they want to stand up for what's right. And um, I, I just had, we just had the best time there. So we're, we're really that's grateful awesome. for your state and, and, and the people you represent. Awesome. So uh, let's let's talk a little bit for a minute. Of course, we're in the middle of this. I, actually, I woke up today and I'm like, man, this is such a great day. I don't wake up and you know we get hit with so much negative news all the time in this 24 hour cycle, and it can be very polarizing and very deflating. But I woke up so encouraged to see, you know, the target, you know, 11 billion dollar loss. I think right now as it goes and it's no end in sight. You know, we have 45,000 signatures, people that have signed our, our, our small petition. And it just seems like people are fighting back against this indoctrination. What do you, what, what's your feeling? Oh, I, I think the same. I think that this, first of all, it is just tremendously hopeful to see everyday Americans standing up and saying, we're not going to allow these woke companies to shove this ideology down our throat and to try to indoctrinate our kids. I really think people draw the line at kids. I mean, there's just something about it. I can say this as a dad myself, little kids, like I don't want my kids being taught that there's something wrong with them if they want to be the gender God made them to be. You know what I mean? It's like, don't tell my boys that they shouldn't be boys. Don't tell my girls that women don't exist. Don't say to my little girl that she can't play sports one day because all of these men are going to be in her sporting leagues or in her locker room. Give me a break. And I just think with Target, to see people stand up and say, we don't have to take this. We don't have to buy this stuff. We don't have to support this company. I think it's amazing. Well, and, and I think, you know, <clears throat> you see the pushback happening online, on social media, but What's interesting is, you know, we're at the soccer games and we're at the baseball practice and we're like we're in Orange County, right? Like like suburbia, you know, where we live down here. And my wife just says she's blown away because, I mean, even the Disney thing, like, of course, we were pressing that, the pushback against that. And some of the other things we we're taking a stand against. She's like, everyone's talking about this target thing. Yeah. Like it's like a, it's like caught. It's like. At the soccer practices, at the baseball games, like moms are talking, they just can't believe. And it's almost like this unmasking of evil has happened and these corporations have underestimated where America is at. Yep, like, 100%. I, I mean, it, and it's not, these aren't even all believers. These are just Americans. Like these are just yep. normal, you know, like Americans that are raising kids and why are these companies, why do you feel like that they're, why are they underestimating? Are they living in their own echo chamber or what, what yeah, is the yeah. deal? Yeah, they live in their own echo chamber. Part of it is, is that they don't have any American workers anymore who make anything. You know, all of their products are made in China. I mean, it's, seriously, they don't have any workforce of any size 
that they get any feedback from. It used to be when these companies used to sell American products, you know, they had American workers for the, all their supply chains. And those workers, you know, you had to contend with them. You had to listen to them. Those workers wanted to be proud of being part of that company, supplying that company. And now these huge corporations have outsourced all that stuff. They buy all the stuff from overseas. So then, then the corporate execs, they all talk to one another, fly around on their planes together, go to Davos together. They're all social liberals, <laughs> Marxists, cultural Marxists. Right. So they just think... We, this is how we all think. And this is what those Americans, those those people, you know, those those God-fearing Americans, they're ignorant. They need to be taught what's the real thing. And, and I think to have the American people stand up and say, no, we don't have to buy your stuff is awesome. Yeah, it is awesome. And, and I think it's awesome to see that, you know, uh, you can't boycott everything, obviously. Me and my wife are talking about this. Like, where do you draw the line? I mean, it's, there's so much wokeness and and, and indoctrination. However, it, it feels like if we can keep these companies in check, you know, I mean, I, I mean, it, it is frustrating and, and it's, it's very much inconvenient to have to go to all, instead of just going to Target to go to all the other kind of random stores. However, it feels like America right now is sending a message. And I'm wondering, you know, it, there's a spiritual side of this. There's like, a, there's like, a, like I mentioned, an unmasking, an unveiling of evil. And of course, we're heading into June, uh, Pride Month, and it's just gone to like the nth degree. Um, but it feels like there's a strong resistance right now. And I don't know when these come, you know, it's like people were like, okay, you've lost $10 billion. And then the CEO comes out and says, you know, well, we're going to move stuff to the back of the store because we're getting threats. You know, that that's what that's what he said, because we're getting threats. And then, of course, you see online the data, the, <laughs> the videos circulating from 2020 when BLM was destroying Target. It's like, oh, you mean these kind of threats? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, this is how the left, by the way, always tries to treat normal Americans. It's just what they tried to do to parents, as you remember, Sean, who went to those school board meetings. It's like, oh, if you dare to question us, then you're a domestic terrorist. You know, we'll bring the law against you. I mean, so they're, they're trying to do the same thing now. If, if you say, I'm not going to buy your stuff, they're like, you're a terrorist. It's like, just because people don't want to buy your stuff means doesn't mean it's a terrorist. You know, it, maybe it means that you've got a problem. Maybe it means that you're trying to force a woke ideology on people that they don't believe in and they don't want their kids exposed to. So I just, the, the left's playbook is so tired on this, but it's also, it's so threatening and it's basically to abuse our, our justice system and to try to leverage it against anybody who speaks out against them. And I, I'm just tired of it. I'm tired of everyday Americans being told that there's something wrong with them and that they're a threat to the safety of democracy because they speak their mind and stand up for godly principles. Yeah, and I, 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 I like I had an album that released today, and and yet I'm in the middle of this Target pushback, and I, I'm trying to help. Like we're celebrating Pentecost weekend. I, there, there's a correlation and a connection spiritually, like in my opinion, like, and, and I want to just hit on this and get your thoughts, and then I want to talk about this amazing book and and everything. But for me, like, there's no difference between us worshiping our hearts out on the National Mall, which is where this record was captured. You were there. It's already like number two right now on iTunes, which is amazing. There's no disconnect for me, right? From worshiping our heart out, going after revival, going after God, and then taking a stand against demonic perversion with Target. Like I can simultaneously do both of these things. And I think that, that there's a fullness to the gospel that God is actually calling us into. You, you look at it with the book of Acts, right? The purpose of the book of Acts in the infilling of the Holy Spirit, which we're celebrating this weekend, is actually power from on high unto boldness, right? Unto a bold believer that takes a stand and exposes works of, of, of evil is what Ephesians says we're called to do, right? Like, like, don't hide them, expose them so that everyone can see them. Like, why do you feel like there's been a disconnect between like, well, you can't be a mean Christian. Are you gonna, Sean, why don't you just stay and worship God? Why do you gotta get distracted? And I'm like, for me, there's no separation. Like these two go together. The songs and the worship empowers us to actually live the songs out. Absolutely. Yeah. And I just, I just think about from a historical perspective, think about William Wilberforce. Go tell William Wilberforce 
and go tell the American abolitionists that their faith shouldn't have any political effect. You know, oh, no, 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 just, just stay inside your church and think, really? Well, slavery never would have been abolished. The slave trade in the UK, slavery in this country, never would have happened unless Christians had said, you know, actually, no, the gospel has real world consequences. We've got to take the gospel with us out everywhere we go. So I just think that, that some of these, particularly in the evangelical culture, I think a lot of times some of these evangelical leaders, and this is not to cast aspersions on anybody, but it's almost like, oh, we don't want to see any controversial because we don't want to be criticized. And it's like, guys, you know, I mean, what is it that Jesus says in, in John? He says in the upper room, right? It's like if the, if the world loves you, it's because you're not for me. The world hates you because I've chosen you out of the world. So amen, you know, let's embrace that. That doesn't mean that we have to be controversial for the sake of it. But it means that we love the gospel. We're not afraid to preach the gospel. We're not afraid to stand on the gospel. And if that brings controversy, then, you know, okay, so be it. Well, and I feel like if you're a follower of Jesus in 2023 and uh, and you're speaking the truth and you're standing for what's right, if you're not getting pushback and you're not getting smoke, you got to question whether you're following Jesus. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. it, the the... the, the the culture is so hostile, right? So angry. So it's like you can feel the rage, the antichrist spirit that's rising up and raging on the people of God. However, at the same time, there's incredible revival, right? There's incredible awakening. We're seeing it in every capital we go to. What What is your take on being a believer? Of course, you're a, you're a sitting senator who loves God and and, and you, your family's amazing, and you, you you love Jesus, and you're raising them. How, what is your encouragement to everyday believers as they navigate this minefield of of in, insanity, uh, just the days that we're living in? Well, I think of something um, that actually C.S. Lewis wrote. I think it's in his his book, The Great Divorce, and it just pops into my mind now. But he's got. If, and, and the Lewis lovers out there, if I get this wrong, I'm sure they'll correct me. But I think it's in The Great Divorce, and, and the, that's when the, a, a guy kind of gets a bus, a bus trip to heaven. And while he's there, he sees a woman who has this large procession of people around her because she was somebody really important. And, I, and he asks his guide, who's an angel, the guy who's visiting heaven, is like, oh, who is this woman? She must have been like royalty or something. Uh, during her time on earth. And he says, oh, she, yeah, she's extremely, extremely influential, extremely powerful, extremely significant for the kingdom. But on earth, nobody knew her name. And I just think that is such a powerful picture of how the gospel works. And I think it's an incredible encouragement to Christians now. The culture may tell you, you're not significant. The culture may tell you, you sit down and shut up. They may send every message to you. You should be afraid. You should be intimidated. Nothing you will do will matter. But in fact, it's as we worship the Lord, it's as we're faithful to the Lord, it's as we take our stand in the Lord, even imperfectly, even if it's like, ah, I didn't do that right, or I should have been more bold, or I didn't use the right words, doesn't matter. The Lord honors that, and there's incredible power from the Spirit that I think operates on that. So I would just say to believers out there, listen, however imperfect it feels to you, if you're willing to take a stand, God will use that to advance his kingdom. He will use that for transformation purposes. And we've got, to, we've got to have faith and put our roots down into those promises of God right now because the world will tell us you're not making any difference. You're a bunch of losers. You're on the losing side of history. Just give up. In fact, we know how the story ends. We've got the greatest news of all. And we know that by standing for the Lord, we are transforming history. I think we've got to believe that now more than ever. Man, that's awesome. It, we do got to believe that. We know the end of the story. Um, what? Tell me a little bit about your – I love this – book that you're writing that you wrote and released i love this call like this restoration of manhood why is that something that's been so attacked in our culture well the, the left really hates manhood of course hates womanhood too for the reasons we've been talking about the war on, on gender but it really hates manhood i think because it stands in the way men stand in the way of so much the left wants to do you know they, they want to completely overturn our history. They want to separate us from our past, particularly our past that's so rooted in the Bible and the traditions of the Bible. They want to overturn all of that. They want to have a liberal elite run this country, not the people anymore. And men stand in the way of that. Good, strong, independent men stand in the way of that. So I think they want them cleared, they want them cleared off the field, off the board. You know, and Similarly with the family. They, we're now told by the left that the family is a vestige of white patriarchy. You know, It's racist. Well, you know, mothers and fathers, men and women, they stand in the way. So they, they want parents and families separated and, and cleared off the board. And I just think the book is about trying to reclaim 
what the Bible's vision is for good, healthy, strong manhood. And so I just go through the scripture. I start with Genesis, looking at Adam in the garden. What did God call Adam to do? You know, God made the world. He created the Garden of Eden. He put Adam in the middle of it. And his charge to Adam was, follow me and expand the garden out into the rest of the world. Be a guy who brings a garden into a wilderness. Take the wilderness, make it a garden. Take order, take chaos rather, make it order. Do it for the glory of God. And I think for men, that is still our most basic fundamental call. Be somebody who brings God's garden, his temple, his beauty, bring it into the world. And the whole book is about, is trying to unpack what that means. Wow, I love that. I love that you're writing that. I I, I grew up um, and my, I'll never forget my dad. You know, he took me to to promise keepers and uh you know that, that big men's movement for those that aren't familiar with it and it was huge i mean i think they did like a million men on the mall and they did so many it was like a movement you know uh, back in the 90s and i remember going to rfk stadium um in actually in dc and uh going there i think i was probably maybe 13 years old 12 13 years old very formative time in my life um, as a kid and I remember seeing like 60,000 men, like lifting their hands, singing to God, uh, tears coming down their face, dedicating their life to Jesus, uh, repenting of their sins, taking the call to be the leader of their home. Like it so marked my life. Like it, it like I can't even put into words, like being in that stadium and seeing this picture of, okay, this is this is happening. Like God is restoring these men. And I remember thinking it's unstoppable. Like what God can do in a culture, in a society, in a nation, as men are restored into their true calling. Uh, what are your hopes for another kind of movement like that? Like what, it, what do you feel like as you're writing this book, it's kind of a blueprint, so to speak. Like what is, what is the goal in your heart and the takeaway? Um, just, just, and just referencing my own flashpoint in, in, in my growing up as a kid. Yeah, my, my hope is that we'll be able to inspire a generation of men to say, "I want to, I want to be all that God called me to be. I want to transform my life by living into the kind of character that God called me to be." I mean, I think the bottom line is when you look at what the Bible says about manhood, it really says that that true manhood is a kind of character. You know, the Lord cares about our character. He cares about our hearts. He wants to form us as men to have a heart like his. He wants to form us as men to join him in his work. And I think the message to men is God has work for you to do. You know, he created you with a purpose and he has things for you to do in the world that are uniquely yours. You're in situations that only you can bring hope to, only you can bring transformation to. And if you will do that, if you will do what God has meant you to do, if you will form your character and follow him, you can transform your life, you can transform the lives of people around you, and you can transform this nation. And I think men need to hear that they matter and that they have the power to be transformative in their lives. It's my hope that men will, will get that and will hold on to it. I, uh, I remember uh, a, a good friend of mine, Sean Alexander, he was a running back for the uh, Seattle Seahawks. He won uh, MVP. Uh, great man of God. I think he has seven kids, uh, godly father. Well, he was on the Redskins for his, the last like kind of twilight of his career. And one day he was, he was actually on a tour of the white house. This is in the Obama years. So, uh, Obama is like a huge college football guy. And he heard that Sean Alexander was in the white house and he was like, I can't believe it. This is like my favorite running back in college. And so he, he, he called Sean into his office. I think, I, don't, I, th I think it was the Oval Office. I don't remember the exact thing he told me, but in the White House and started to talk to him about, we need your help. We need, we need to change these inner cities, like these inner cities across America. Like, will you, will you help us, right? This is the president at the time talking to Sean Alexander. And, and Sean Alexander looked at Obama and he said, the problem is there's no fathers. And he said, everything just went quiet in the room. Yeah. The problem is there's no fathers. You're missing the root of the issues. What? T t tell me about that. Like, yeah. how, how do we see that plaguing our culture right now? 
Well, you know, I want the culture. You see it in the epidemic of childhood poverty. You know what I mean? Look at where the poverty is. It's when dads aren't present in the home, not doing what they're supposed to do to provide for their kids and for their wife. You know, if you want to end child po childhood poverty in America, essentially, just put dads back in the home. We see it with violence. You know, you want to you want to get curtail the epidemic of youth violence in this country. Put a dad into a neighborhood. Put a dad into a home. I mean, that's what will do it. So we're all over. We're seeing the effects of not having fathers present. You know, I mean, kids who don't have their dads are more likely to be depressed, more likely to be violent, more likely to get bad grades, more likely to commit suicide. I mean, it, it's the numbers are really clear. And I think for young men, the message ought to be this. Is it any accident that when God calls Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abraham, he calls him to leave his dad's house. You know, Abraham's an old man by now and he's still hanging around his dad's tents. He says, you know, go, go out from there. Go take, I'm going to send you someplace else. Go take a risk. I'm going to make you a, I'm going to make you a significant man. So to put it mildly. And what is it God calls Abraham to do? Be a father. He says to Abraham, I'm going to make you a father. You're going to be significant. I'm going to make you a father. And I think from young men, we need to send the message loud and clear. You want to live a life that is transformative, a life that is powerful, be a father. And I, I think that young men will respond to that if they can see that vision. What is your advice to people like, um, you know, people that grew up, men that grew up, didn't have a dad, um, didn't have a model, didn't have an example. I mean, they, they know they're called to this, but they just feel like, I don't even know where to start, you know? Yeah. What's your heart or encouragement to those because there's a lot of them especially in gen z and, and millennials for sure and then a lot of guys who maybe dad was present in the home but or a abusive, in the or, yeah. didn't have a good relationship with them and that is so 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 many men in this country and i would just say a couple things i mean the first thing is is that with what the the bible shows us great pictures of what strong healthy fathers look like so we can always turn there you can look for men in your life in my story in my book, I tell stories from my own life about people who mentored me, coaches, my grandfather, my own dad was very significant to me, but I tell stories of other men in my life who God brought into my life who were hugely significant. And I think for guys who was like, oh, dad wasn't there, dad was there, and it was bad, you know, where else can you look? What other, what other role models are there in your life or in the culture who you can go to? Is there another man, an older guy, you can say, okay, you've been a dad, can you help me down this road? But I would just say the word of encouragement would be this, is that even if your own dad was messed up or not around, that doesn't mean it, can, it has to transfer to you. You can be the one who changes the destiny of your family. You can do it. I mean, we see that over and over. That's the message in the scripture. You know, I mean, God intervening in one life will change the destiny of entire families. So I think the hope for young men is, hey, if, if your upbringing was messed up, that's all right. You know, I mean, the Lord can work with that. You can be the person who breaks whatever cycles may be there, you can change your life. You can change the destiny of your family if you'll follow God's plan for your life. And I just think that that's incredibly hopeful. Is it easy? No, of course it's not easy. Nothing in life that's worth doing is easy, but it's incredibly hopeful. And I think men need to hear that message. Yeah. I, I also, I want to add something too. Like I have, I just found this picture the other day. Um, I don't know if we can see it on here. This is my dad baptizing me in the Amazon river in brazil and uh I, I didn't even know this picture actually existed and um of course my dad was the most significant figure in my life and he he uh you know passed away actually i he passed away of cancer terminal brain cancer right when i was going to be a dad right so like kate was pregnant with our first i lost my dad i became a dad within a period of three months and one of the things I want to encourage people of, and maybe you can talk about this for a minute too, Josh, is that I felt the, the father's love. Like I felt like here I lost my dad. I'm like, how am I going to be a dad? Like I had a great example, but I, I still needed my dad. I was 29 years old. Um, but the Bible says he's a father to the fatherless. You know, he's a father to the fatherless. And I feel like there's a grace coming. And we're talking about this in Father's Day is coming up. And we have a fatherless generation. And in, in Malachi, we see the great promise at the end of the Old Testament is we'll turn the hearts of the children to the fathers and the hearts of fathers to the children, right? So we have this promise. But I believe that there's a grace God's releasing that people that haven't known a father, people that haven't had a father's touch, I believe God is releasing that grace and and it took me losing my dad for the first time in my life to realize okay 
he's a father and fatherless. God is my father. What, have you seen that happen with people? Have you, do you feel like God and the Holy Spirit is combating this fatherless generation by releasing that revelation? Have you seen that in your own life or in people that you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I absolutely. Yes to all of the above. I think that is for sure true. And I do think there's something incredibly powerful in your life when you become a father. I think God begins to move in your life in a new way. It, it, I think it makes you, and I try to write about this in the book a little bit, my own experience, I think it makes you more humble and more dependent. You know, when you become a dad, you realize that, oh, wow, you know, I, I'm, a lot, I'm a lot more selfish I'll just speak for myself. When I became a dad, I was like, oh, all right. I already knew I was selfish because when I got married, I figured out real quick, I'm pretty selfish. And then when I became a father, I was like, oh, no, whole nother level. Like, my life has really <laughs> been centered around me. And then I realized, like, man, I don't know. I don't know how to do this. Like, I, I, I need help. And it made me more humble. It made me dependent on the Lord in a new way. And because of that, I began to know him as father in a new and profound way because I was needy. And I think sometimes as men, you know, we don't like to talk about our need because nobody wants to be needy. But sometimes it's like, listen, your need can be the key to your destiny. You know, you, you, when, you, when you encounter your need and you're like, I need to know what it's like to have a good father. I need to know how to be a good father. The Lord will answer that. And he will answer that by pouring his life into yours. He will answer that by fathering you. And I've experienced that in my own life. Fathering my boys has been an opportunity for me to be fathered by God in new ways because I needed it. And I just think there's something that's incredibly powerful powerful there. The Lord will respond to us in our need. And I think I, I think we see him doing that at generational scale. And that's exciting. That's powerful. Yeah, that is so powerful. And and you know, there's the spiritual the spiritual fathering component too, I feel like there's something about when you become a, father, a spiritual father, when you pour into somebody else, God will bring somebody to pour into you. I've seen that in my own life where it's like, God, I need a spiritual father to navigate these seasons that I'm in right now. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what to do. I'm in over my head. And I always, I always feel like the Lord's saying, father, somebody pour into somebody and I'll have somebody pour into you. So there's a, there's a connection there. Like you're saying, you become a father and it's like right when you become a father, God starts releasing these revelations you're going to need, you know, to totally, know how to father. Totally. I love totally, this, man. Totally. Tell everybody where they can get the book, the title, all that kind of stuff. Obviously, it's I'm sure it's doing amazing, and we just want to make sure everybody can read this. The title is Manhood, The Masculine Virtues of American Needs. You can get it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, or any, any bookstore. Uh, you should be able to find it. And uh, I hope it's a blessing to, to every guy who reads it. It was a blessing to me to get to write it and work through it. I dedicate it to my boys, Elijah and Blaze. It's kind of an open letter to them. And uh, I, I hope that uh, it will be as much of a blessing to other guys as it, as it has been for me, just looking at what the Lord has done and the amazing plan he calls us to as men. Come on, that is so good. Before, uh, before you go, I, I'd love it. I think it'd be really cool if you could just pray over... Uh, the fathers, you know, people you listening bet, bet. Um, uh, across the world, and especially as we approach Father's Day, yeah, man. I mean, we're what we're seeing, you know, to bring it full circle with the with the attack and the indoctrination on our kids, with this crazy feminist movement that's trying to, you know, push men to the corner, and with with the, you know, LGBTQ agenda, to to. to you know, I have a friend. Last thing, I had a, a, a one of my a, a, an amazing guy uh, who's we work with in our movement, a revivalist. He grew up with two moms. He never had a dad. He was an artificial insemination guy. He was an AI baby, and he is one of the most powerful, manly. Like it was like God did something so supernatural. Right, the enemy tried to steal that part of his life, and God was like, nah. I'm coming in. I'm going to make this guy a, a, a revivalist and a legend, and he is. He goes across California and, and, and preaches, and people get saved and healed and delivered. So even as you're praying, I believe people out there, like I believe God's in the restorative business. And this yeah. is this message that you wrote, Josh, is a, is, a, is a blueprint, but it's also prophetic as it's going to release a fathering movement in our generation. So thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Should I pray? Okay. All right. Lord, thank you for this time with Sean. Thank you for every man who listens to this podcast. Thank you for every father out there, every man who wants to be a father. And Lord, we just thank you that you are our father. 
that the idea of fatherhood came from you, and we know what fatherhood is because of you. And we just pray, Lord, that you would release your spirit in a powerful new way on every father in this country. And Lord, we pray that as, as men begin to feel the call toward fatherhood, as they say, yeah, I want to go after that, that they would be drawn to you as they encounter their own need as fathers. And whether that's from their dad or whether it's just trying to figure out how to do it, as they encounter their need, Lord, would you come in and supply that need super abundantly? Would you bring more men to know you, Jesus? Would you bring more men to honor you? And would you raise up a generation of fathers in this country who want to live sacrificially for you, for their wives, for their children, and for the kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Senator Josh Hawley. Oh, last thing. What about those Chiefs, huh? Hey, how about it? How Are you going to run it, it back? It's gonna, I'm going to repeat. This is gonna, it's going uh, to be a repeat year. I'm calling it right now. Mark it down. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Bickle, uh, I was talking to him about it. I said, what about all these prophecies? And he's like, he's like, I don't know. There might be something there, you know, so... It's going to happen. We're going to win again. Hey, they won in a rebuilding year. No one expected it. So who knows what this looks like. The sky's the limit. So exactly. Congratulations. Thank hey, you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for, for having me.